Okay, Molly, how did you meet Clifford and what were your first impressions when you came to the Pemberton Valley? Well, I came to the Pemberton Valley by chance. I went for a job in Squamish in a, uh, a restaurant called the Waltz Inn. Well, the restaurant was all right, but a part of the deal was that you got your accommodation to sleep. Well, when I saw the sleeping accommodation and the sheets weren't just dirty, they were gray with dirt, I decided this wasn't for me. So I waltzed out, you might say, and I had met coming up on the boat, because the boat met the train, uh, some people from up here, and Clifford's aunt Gladys, you know, Ed Roman's mother, uh, she says, well, why don't you come to Pemberton for the weekend? So I thought that was a good idea, so I did. But when I got there, uh, she got talking anyway. He said they're looking for someone at a hotel. So that's how I cooked at a hotel for a while. And uh, that's when I met Clifford and almost everybody else in the district too. And the ones I didn't meet in the hotel, uh, the women, when I went to work in the store, the hotel manager decided his wife could do the cooking. So I uh, worked in the store after that and got to know all the rest of them. So that's how. That's how you met Clifford? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was a nice place. Everybody was very friendly, really friendly. And you got to know everybody, not just a few of them, everybody. I, all the people that were living in the valley then I met before I was married. Even one or two beside, people from like Myrtle Phillips from Whistler came in in the spring to do some shopping, came up on the train and then I met uh, the man who was the section foreman from Green River, Gimondi Bruno. He was a character if ever had one. And I worked, as I told you, I worked at the hotel, but later I worked at the store. I, I did board in at the hotel when I worked there. Was it the same building that it is now, smaller? The, the, that's the main mm -hmm. part, and uh, I slept up at the top. But, uh, I had to share a room with the manager's daughter who was a bit of a flake, and I, she had somebody given her some chickens. My next time I went to bed, there was this whole bunch of chickens. So I said, well now, I'm not unreasonable, Francis, but I said, those chickens are going out. And oh, she was uh, really upset with me, but I said, I said, they're going out. I said, you can put them outside the door, but they're I said, I'm not sleeping with chickens. <laughs> anyway, um, well, we got married, and. I must admit I found life on the farm tougher than I'd expected at the beginning. Uh, so a lot of things I'd never learned how to do. See, a lot of the women who come to work for married farmers were themselves raised on a farm, like Elsie and so on. But I never had anything to do with animals. I you know, handled the chickens all right, but I never got really any good with the cows. And as for the horses, they intimidated me completely. Uh, but um, it was nice for lots of things, you know, the kids has an easy life and all that sort of thing. But of course there wasn't really very much money in the beginning. And well, they talk about living on off the land. Well, we had our own milk and eggs and meat and I never bought store meat. I still have never bought meat down the road to school. And uh, they of course I made the butter and all that, about 200 pounds of butter every year and so on. And uh, it was a lot of hard work. Clifford had a big garden and when people talk about living off the land how wonderful it would be. I don't think they've ever really tried it. 
because it's great, but it's, it, you can't pretend it isn't work. It involves a lot of hard work. I wasn't much of a gardener, but we did used to put up a lot of stuff. I know one year I put up 60 quarts of corn, and it takes a dozen cobs to fill a quart. And in those, I picked them all and shucked them and did them. Sometimes Clifford and the kids would help with the shucking. His mother would come over and help with some of these jobs. But we used to, we had raspberries, everything. And you tried to just live on what you had there. And we used to get crab apples up the road for nothing off her. Yeah, and then, of course, <coughs> The coming of the power, that was um, for up the upper valley, that was 1951. And we heard one morning by the grapevine that um, they were pulling out, of the, it was then BC Electric, and that anybody who wanted to who lived a long way from the road could get their uh, wire and the connectors. Well, we went down there, and uh, Billy Fowler was there too, and there was no one around. There was a shed with all the stuff. We could see it through the window. And somebody said, oh, he's over in the beer parlor. So Billy says, well, I'll get him out of the beer parlor. So he went off, and the man came over very grumpy, and he said, well, you can't expect me to roll out the wire. So Billy started it on the wire. He says, no problem, I'll roll it out. You know, I really think he wanted some extra wanted money. money. But of course, <laughs> we didn't have much money then. And we got all the connectors to go to the road for $120. You wouldn't get it for that now. Yes, and right. Clifford had got the the poles and put them up and then the the men who are maintenance men who were left went down and saw them and they came they said they'd do it for twenty five dollars and lunch. So they did it for twenty five dollars and I gave them a big lunch and they were quite happy with that and so were we. That was the big thing. And the first appliance that we got was I imagine a washing machine, but the second one was a freezer. I got a freezer years before I got a fridge, and uh, it made all the difference. Prior to the freezer, all the meat was canned, and I'll tell you, canned meat, if it comes off the best steak or it comes off the square end, it all tastes the same, just like canned meat. And when you have it, day after day, you know, it's not very exciting to put it mildly. So it made a tremendous difference to the diet.